The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, something super crappy is lurking beneath the waters at a summer resort. Talk about your crappy vacations. On the other hand, if Olivia can survive, she's bound to win the big crappy thon rodeo at Lake Endor this year. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we talk with author Will McCarthy about his new novel, Antediluvian. Will tells us about some of the research behind this very cool tale of a scientist accessing his own quantum memory states in order to visit humanity's primordial history. And the very real places where and people from whom so many of our ancient archetypes and myths arose. It's a cool book, and it's cool talk. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. And now, here's the news. The October mass market paperbacks are blasting forth like bats from Carl's Bad Caverns in the summer, but in this case filling the sky with reading goodness for readers to grab like an eagle snatching a bat and consume it with your mind. Ooh, scary. So decorate your October with some great mass market paperbacks. We have the great pumpkin of mass markets out, as a matter of fact, this month, which is Uncompromising Honor by David Weber. The time has come. The Manticore and Star Kingdom and its allies go to war against the massive and corrupt Solarian Empire. After a tragic loss, Honor Harrington enters the fray once again. She's filled with steely resolve, possessed of cold competence and motivated by a fiery determination to take the fight to the enemy and end its menace forever. Also out in mass market in October is Star Destroyers, edited by Tony Daniel, yours truly, and Christopher Rocchio. Big ships blowing things up. In space, size matters, as this collection of original fiction proves. All new tales of massive superweapons and the starships that carry them. From David Drake, Jody Lynn Nye, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, Michael Z. Williamson, and many more. Star Destroyers, edited by Tony Daniel and Christopher Rocchio, and Uncompromising Honor by David Weber are now at booksellers everywhere. Get them, take them to your nest, and devour them at your leisure. That's what they're for. I want to welcome Will McCarthy to the podcast. Hello. How's it going, Will? Going great. How are you? Pretty good. Um, engineer, novelist, journalist, entrepreneur, Will McCarthy is a former contributing editor for Wired Magazine and science columnist for the Sci-Fi Channel. He has been nominated for the Nebula, Locus, Theodore Sturgeon, and Philip K. Dick Awards, among others. His short fiction has graced the pages of Analog, Asimov's Wired, and SF Age, and his novels include the New York Times notable uh, Bloom, and oh, that's the novel, it's named Bloom, of course, and uh, Amazon.com, Best of Y2K, The Collapsium, one of the coolest titles of any science fiction book ever, uh, a national bestseller. We're going to put that, we are reissuing that, correct? Yeah. Um, Bain will have it out in the, in the spring, I believe. He has written for TV, appeared on the History Channel and the Science Channel, and published nonfiction in half a dozen magazines. Previously a flight controller for Lockheed Martin's Space Launch Systems and later an engineering manager for Omnitech Robotics and founder, president, CTO of Ravenbrick LLC. Uh, Will now writes patents for a top law firm in Dallas and holds a bunch of patents himself in a bunch of different countries. Um, but out now at, at booksellers everywhere is uh, the novel Antediluvian by Will McCarthy. Um, well, can you tell us a little bit about, I, I guess maybe we should just start by saying what is it that um, that Tara McKeerjee sees as we open the novel, as, as, um, as Harv is fitting this thing to his head? <laughs> what's, what's going on with this? Well, my thought, um, 
you know, this I, I try to uh, put ex- rig- rigorously extrapolated science in my in my stories. Um, this one is just an unsupported literary device. Uh, my my thought was, what if there were uh, extra information uh, kind of attached to the genome um, that could be used to extract the memories of our ancestors? And so the idea is that. Uh, uh, using nuclear magnetic resonance and a quantum computer to uh, tap into the information that's uh, stored in the in the Y chromosome and be able to re-experience memories of uh, male ancestors. You sure made it sound reasonable in the book. The idea is that depending on where your ancestry is, um, you harbor what could be memories first one is pretty far back even though because we're even though um even though we're going to go farther um and it and, and each one is in a sense representative of a moment in human uh human history prehistory i would i guess so the first one is the flood myth um and and what is going on here and what do you posit well, I would hardly be the first person to observe that uh, flood myths occur all over the world, uh, and a lot of them have some very remarkable similarities. Um, the two that I focused on most heavily are the, the story of Noah uh, from the Old Testament and the story of Manu from the Rig Veda. Uh, these two stories have an awful lot in common. Uh, they both build an ark because they, they know that a flood is coming, um, they both have three sons, and the three sons have very similar names. It doesn't take a lot of uh, reading of these two myths to realize that they they clearly spring from a common source. And so what I tried to do was to look at the elements that were common between the two myths and kind of in the way that uh, people reconstruct ancient languages by looking at the uh, the words that still exist in the, in the daughter languages today. Um, by, by looking at these two myths and kind of reconstructing backward to a, a single story that, that contains all of the salient details of, uh, of both of those stories. And I pulled in also uh, elements from the Epic of Gilgamesh and a few of the other uh, very old flood myths, which, you know, again, they haven't, there's enough commonality there to, to uh, really suggest that that the stories are are older than we give them credit for, and they're they're all linked. Tell us a little bit about Manoa. Um, is it Hassis, the uh, the main character of this of this part, who um, Harv, our scientist, has sort of um, accessed his 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 point of view. Um, he is uh, he's an interesting guy, um, and he is in no way um, he's very modern in a way. But you've made him into a merchant. He has a really nicely developed sense of irony and, and humor, right? Yeah, that that idea that uh, you know, I think it throughout it, through all the time periods uh, in the in the story, I tried to really humanize the characters. There's a real tendency, uh, particularly the farther back you go in time, there's a real tendency to make people these sort of grunting brutes with with not a lot going on upstairs, but uh, there's no real reason to think that people in ancient times had any less of an inner life than we have today. Um, but uh, Manoa is a, uh, yeah, as you say, he's a merchant. Um, he owns seven boats, which makes him the, the greatest uh, fleet owner in the, in the history of the world at that time. Um, and he also has a hereditary position of harbor master, which means it's his job to monitor this harbor and uh you know make it safe for uh for boats to pass through and in the course of his his work as harbor master and in the course of his work as a as a sailor and a merchant um he can't help noticing that the water level is rising year by year by year uh and he posits that it's because of the melting of the glaciers and he's he's correct about that um he doesn't know it, but he's situated at the end of the Ice Age, and uh, uh, the sea level 
rose 120 meters at the end of the Ice Age, which is a, an awful lot. And the coastline, in some cases, was was uh, moved by by hundreds of miles. And at times this happened slowly. At other times it happened very quickly and very catastrophically. And it's the it's the latter type event that uh, mm-hmm. that we're focusing on here. That uh, Manoa gets gets this this uh, uncomfortable sense that the water is rising and it's going to keep on rising and that something needs to be done, but he doesn't know what, and he has uh, no real luck convincing other people that uh, that the danger is real or that anything anything could be done about it if it were. Uh, and then this is combined. There's there's pretty good evidence now that the Earth was struck by a comet right around that same time. And if you think about this, if you think about what what's implied by uh, an Earth that's getting warmer and, uh, uh, you know, a large polar cap that's melting into the oceans. If you if you throw a comet impact on top of that, you have all the recipe that you need for a, a really catastrophic event that would be worldwide. It would be a, a global flood that would affect everybody that was living anywhere close to the coast, which is most people. I mean, throughout history, most people have lived uh, on the coast. And uh, we also know, uh, due to a variety of archaeological evidence, that uh, there are megalithic structures. There are, you know, cut stone cities on the on the floor of the ocean that haven't been above water for 10,000 years. So for people that are accustomed to uh, thinking of Samaria as the, the birthplace of civilization or, or Babylon, uh, uh, in fact, you have to go back 6,000 years or more before that, uh, at least at least that far. Uh, people were, were already building cities. The reason it's not part of our recorded history is because those cities were literally destroyed in a literal deluge, and they're at the bottom of the ocean now. Yeah, and, the, and they archaeologically exist, we know, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and the thing that's interesting is how kind of fragmented that knowledge is. Uh, even though there's clear archaeological evidence, the, the archaeological community only accepts it in bits and pieces. They don't seem to have really stepped up to the, the this larger idea uh, that that there was a I don't want to say a global civilization, but that civilization was uh, in existence globally, uh, in existence in a large number of different uh, parts of the globe at at the time that uh, the uh, the Ice Age ended. One of the things you point out in the story, which I had no idea, was that um, the speed of light is is given in the Vedas. <laughs> is that right? Uh, it, it seems to be. I mean, it, it, it's a matter of interpretation. Uh, it, it could be a coincidence, but if you if you uh, uh, you know look at those passages, and uh, you know, I haven't done the the unit conversions myself, but there are people who have converted these these old units, uh, you know, through different series of of uh, uh, units, historical units, uh, into their modern equivalents. And yes, it. It does appear that uh, the speed of light was known uh, to the uh, the Vedic Hindus uh, at least, you know, six thousand years ago. Probably uh, longer than that. That was really cool. The the interaction that Manu has with his cousin, I guess, who's the uh, astronomer, um, and it, the idea that the priestly caste or whatever um back then were were not um officious uh you know we're in touch with the god types that they had their own doubts about things as well it was um was it was a nice touch i thought well thanks yeah i uh, i i called them the cleric astrologers and yeah, their their uh, role was to kind of try and figure out what was going on. Uh, to you know, to to measure the speed of light, you have to have uh, the way that the way that we learned the speed of light was by sh- watching the shadows of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and to watch the shadows of the moons of Jupiter, you need a telescope that's that's fairly capable. Uh, which means you have to have an eye on the heavens. You have to have a pretty good idea 
what's going on up there uh, and a, a pretty good head for numbers to to kind of trace it all out. And so I gave the, the cleric astrologers that role, and they're not perfect at it. They they have a lot of large gaps in their knowledge, uh, and, you know, they're they're trying to make sense of things. Um, you know, a, a, a central point in the in the story, there's a comet sort of looming over the world for an extended period of time, and they don't really know what it means. They've seen comets before, but nothing this close, nothing this big. They don't know if it's good luck or bad luck or or if it means anything at all. Um, of course, it turns out to be very bad luck, uh, and this may have something to do with why uh, even, you know, into, into uh, you know, the Middle Ages, comets were, were generally seen as an unlucky phenomenon. So the uh, Manu uh, Noah figure uh, deals with with what happens, um, and we move, and Harv at the time is um, he is uh, experiencing this along with him, um, and he wakes up, uh, or he's having a seizure. Um, he comes out of this. Um, this this sort of dream reverie but it's you know he's actually seen history can he affect this past that he's accessing that's a question in the book i think that... it is a question in the book and i left it deliberately ambiguous um from harv's point of view it seems that he is able to influence events uh but uh even he's not sure that that's really what's happening well, you make a pretty good argument that it's possible through, um, like, uh, the, the quantum entanglement, <laughs> working backward in time, sort of. Uh, I don't yeah, know. and that, that's another area where, uh, you know, uh, uh, the laws of physics don't don't expressly forbid it. So uh, I thought it was it was safe to put that put that in the story. Yeah, well, it's cool science fiction. It gives you a little sense of wonder pop there. Um, that's, and all of this, all of this does, I mean, this is good, hard sense of wonder inducing science fiction for, for those who, who love that sort of thing like me. Um, so the next thing we know, Harv is with, uh, with a group that call themselves knights, right? Um, and they, uh. But this is way farther back, even than uh, well, it's farther back even than uh, than Manu and uh, the Manu Noah guy. Um, we're talking about somewhere in Europe during um, the the Ice Age's conclusion, right? So, it, and and what's going on here? Um, well, this is uh, as you say, it's much farther back. It takes place about thirty thousand years ago, and Again, this is sort of, um, I don't want to describe it as fringe archaeology. It's, it's real archaeology, but it's not necessarily widely uh, uh, discussed. Uh, but there are um, uh, archaeological sites in Croatia, for example, that show a really high degree of technological sophistication. They had fences. Uh, they had uh, uh, pottery, for example. They had cloth. We know they had cloth because we see cloth impressions in pottery fragments that are left behind. Uh, and all of these things supposedly weren't invented for another 20,000 years. Uh, mm -hmm. But we find them in these weird kind of anomalous patches in Europe. So I think it's probably fair to say that these technologies weren't universal. They weren't necessarily widely distributed, but they did occur in pockets very far back in time. And these are sort of the the proto-civilizations, they didn't cut stone blocks, they didn't build, uh, you know, megalithic architecture, but they did s stay in one place and, uh, you know, they, they harvested the same plants over and over again. They didn't necessarily uh, sow seeds into the ground, but they did practice sort of rudimentary agriculture in the sense that they would harvest the cereal crops that, that grew in these valleys uh, you know, just harvest them year year upon year. Uh, so, I just thought it was really interesting to have this idea that that uh, a pocket of of anomalously advanced people um, 
And the other thing that we know about this time period, of course, is that humans were coexisting with Neanderthals at that time. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if, if there were Neanderthals that were adjacent to one of these uh, regions of, of uh, you know, advanced human uh, society? And uh, so that's kind of the, the genesis of the story. Uh, yeah, the, the guys, the, the, the group uh, are, are called knights, and they wear armor. It's made of wood and wicker. But, you know, that's another example. We don't have any evidence that people made armor, but if they knew how to make fences and they knew how to make spears, they probably knew how to make armor. It's a really obvious idea for anyone who ex expects to get into a fight, um, not necessarily a fight with Neanderthals, even just, just hunting animals. Uh, you know, there are a lot of dangerous animals around at this time. So they, they carry spears, they carry stick throwers, uh, they wear armor, they're knights. Yeah, I mean, it's cool to think that that um, sort of archetype might be, uh, because uh, Harv, even for a moment, thinks he might be in the Middle Ages, uh, might be something that, that comes from far, far back, the, the idea of, of a warrior cast of noble people with good with ideals that, that save maidens. Sure, sure. And, you know, if you if you ignore uh, just a handful of technological details like like the presence of metal, uh, I think that some of these, uh, uh, you know, deep in the Ice Age, some of the, the villages that you would encounter at that time would have a lot in common with uh, medieval villages in some of the same areas. Um, but of course, the Neanderthals, uh, they're called trolls and they're viewed as monsters, uh, although arguably uh you know, they have rich inner lives of their own, and they have their own uh, motivations for doing things. So it's not necessarily the Neanderthals that are the monsters in the story. Yeah, and they uh, and you make them gingers, which I thought was odd and interesting. <laughs> so I guess so that they could be uh, susceptible to sunlight. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're... There actually uh, was some thought at around the time that I was starting this book, uh, there was some thought that the red haired gene in um, in humans was actually part of our uh, genetic legacy from the Andertals that, uh, you know, there's there's known to be interbreeding. Most modern humans have a few percent of Neanderthal DNA uh, uh, inside them. And it was thought for a while that uh, red hair was one of those traits that came directly to us from Neanderthals, that it hadn't hadn't existed in the Homo sapiens genome prior to that. Um, we now know that that's not true. We know that the Neanderthals, though, did have their own red hair genes and, and blonde hair genes. Um, they're, uh, from what we're able to, you know, from what little we're able to glean, uh, there was quite a different variety of uh, um, genes for expressing hair color and eye color. Uh, but yes, I did have this idea that that uh, you know we have this myth of trolls that are that are sensitive to to sunlight. They don't go out in the day. They hide under bridges and things like that. And I just thought, well, what if that were true? What if what if that were literally uh, a memory? That's where troll and you you have a, another monster um, show up who which is uh, you posit a, a memory of a of a beast that um, was a primordial um, early Cenozoic beast, right? The, you call it a bullis, which is actually the name of of one of our cats. Uh, but uh, no, the. Um, uh, creature is called an elasmothere, uh, and it has a lot in common with the the Kirin, uh or or Asian unicorn, um, which there's some some evidence to su suggest that the elasmothere might actually have survived into historical times and been recorded as the as the Kirin, um and given us a lot of our a lot of our unicorn myths. Um, but unlike a unlike our vision of a unicorn, the the elasmothere was a very robust creature. It was kind of halfway between a unicorn and a and a rhinoceros, um, and uh, would have been would have been quite a, a terrifying thing to encounter. And the Cro-Magnon people you have there are, they, 
are Europeans descended from people that were in Europe 20,000, 30,000 years ago? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say exactly what went on, uh, exactly where. But, yeah, the best evidence is that the Cro-Magnon people uh, were, were recent immigrants from Africa at the time that this story takes place, that they would have moved in there, you know, within a few thousand years of, uh, of when the story takes place. So these probably would have been dark-skinned uh, people, and they were um, uh, slightly larger than the humans of today, uh, although not as large as the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals were a little bit shorter than the Cro-Magnons, but they were a lot more robust. They had a lot more, a lot more meat on their bones. Uh, but yeah, this, this idea that you have, you have dark-skinned Homo sapiens encountering light-skinned Neanderthals, uh, and you know, each of them regarding the other as, as monsters... And then we get uh, Harf cycles again, and and we go to the Garden of Eden. What what were you positing that myth arose from? Um, and we're talking about the birth of language here as well. Right, right. Uh, there were a couple of different threads that came together for that one. Um, one of them is the uh, you know the the male uh, uh, equivalent of mitochondrial Eve. Mitochondrial Eve is the uh, sort of most recent common ancestor uh, on the on the female lineage. This is the the female from whom all modern humans are are descended. And you know, mitochondrial Eve was a real person. Uh, similarly, there was a, a Y chromosome Adam, who is the the great 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 grandfather of literally all humans that are alive today. Um, now, at the time that I that I started writing this. Um, the thinking was that that uh, Y chromosome Adam happened around 100,000 years ago. Um, that has since been moved a lot farther back. Uh, but uh, all that means is that we found a couple of rare Y chromosome haplogroups uh, that are older than that. Uh, this just means that that most humans are are uh, descended from someone who lived between 60 and 100,000 years ago. Uh, and um, so you have, you know, there's there's good solid genetic evidence that that a real person uh, uh, lived at that time. Who, you know, he must have been a popular guy. He really got around. He he uh, fathered clearly a lot of offspring. Um, at the same time, uh, there's another thing that that happens uh, in the in the fossil record. Um, we see that the uh, sophistication of human technology takes a very sudden jump. Uh, it doesn't just get complicated fast. It uh, stays complicated and starts to kind of accelerate. So something happened around this time that, that allowed people to, to use technology in a more sophisticated way. Uh, and it's very reasonable to suppose that this has something to do with the arrival of complex language. Um, the other thing that we know is that complex language arises as a result of a mutation. It's in a gene called FOXP2. Uh, we have a different form of this gene than, than the other apes do. Um, and uh, it's a very strongly conserved gene in our, uh, in our genome. People who have a, a mutant form of the gene can't speak in complete sentences and tend not to uh, be very attractive mating partners for that reason. Uh, so uh, we we find that that our version of the FOXP2 gene is very strongly conserved. But there had to have been a moment. There had to have been a moment in time when that mutation first occurred. Um, there would have been uh, one person, and then a small number of people, and then a small tribe of people and then a small society of people who had the modern form of the gene, but they would have been surrounded by people who had the more primitive form of the gene. And this strikes me as really a very literal Garden of Eden situation. This is the birth of the human race as we know it. Uh, it almost certainly happened in Northern Africa. And, uh, you know, it almost certainly happened around this time that we see the uh, 
the, the changes in technology happening. So if we place Y chromosome Adam and the FOXP2 mutation uh, uh, in the same time period, then that's, that's kind of where, where you get this story. Um, there's a man named Tick Tick. He starts out as a boy, obviously, as we all do. Uh, but uh, it's, it's his story. It's the story of how he came to become the, the great-great-grandfather of us all. I like that you make him kind of a, um, it, it's not through force of arms that he, he, he succeeds so much as that he's sort of a silver-tongued fellow. Because um, he can talk and they can't. He can formulate what they're thinking. Sure, sure. I mean, if, you, if you're able to tell somebody that, that she's got pretty eyes and, and no one else can tell her that, that that's going to make you a pretty popular guy. Would that that were still an advantage for teenagers? <laughs> Uh, obviously, one of the uh, one of the assumptions that I made for this is that uh, although the um, uh, you know they're called mutes in the story, although the mutes aren't able to speak in complete sentences, they understand complete sentences when they're spoken. Uh, I think something like this must have been true because the the Fox P two mutation took over the entire. I mean, it started in one point, it started in one population, but there were people living all over the world at that time. And somehow the Fox P2 mutation reached every corner of the world long before recorded history started. Um, so this says that that it was a highly sought after gene that the people who who had it were were very much in demand among the people who didn't. Our final uh, leap by Harv um, is way back into uh, Homo erectus um, times. And you seem to have a fascination with boats um, because a, a couple of these stories have boats in them, or at least ancient boats. Um, this is the voyage, and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff about how um, it, Homo erectus got around. Um, wasn't uh, you know the there was cultural stuff going on with Homo erectus. That's that's true. Uh, they almost certainly could not speak in complete sentences, and that would have been uh, a real hindrance to them in terms of uh, uh, propagating a complex culture. And yet, uh, you know, again, there are, there are certain incontrovertible archaeological facts that uh, are are impossible to overlook. Um, the uh, island of Fiorensis uh, with the, the hobbits, the, the human species called hobbits, uh, that's an isolated island. There's no way for people to get there except on boats. Uh, and that would have ha had to have happened uh, a, a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and we see similarly, you know, a million years ago, 800,000 years ago, we see evidence of uh very similar stone tool technologies on the north and south sides of the Mediterranean, um, suggesting that that uh, you know there was there was traffic uh, between points that were that were close at hand uh, if you if, if traverse them by water. Uh, so the conclusion is really kind of inescapable that that uh, Homo erectus is not the grunting, stooping caveman uh, uh, but in fact a, a boat builder and and you know probably a house builder and uh, you know they, they had a uh, a lot more sophistication than than we give them credit for and that's again that's kind of a running theme throughout that uh, I, I just tried to uh, sort of put myself or the people that I know into these times just because Homo erectus couldn't speak doesn't mean he couldn't think. It doesn't mean that these people uh, didn't have rich and interesting lives. It didn't mean that they they didn't you know fall in love or get jealous or or uh, you know stare across the water and and wonder if they could uh, could get there. And our our main character is um, he, he has this yearning, yeah. And uh, what is it? I mean, I, I can't imagine, I mean, most animals I don't imagine have a yearning to travel uh, except to go find some food or something. Um, is, is 
does that have something to do with conceptual the ability to conceptualize maybe that he could imagine what it would be like over there or something like that i don't know um yeah that that's that's pretty close to what i intended um uh homo erectus was a species that that uh you know like homo sapiens they started in africa and like homo sapiens they covered the entire world um that doesn't happen without a certain amount of wanderlust uh unless there's a a desire to go places um you know you're you're not going to find people spreading you know uh, to to whole other continents and across ocean gaps and and things like that so so there must have been some kind of a yearning what what makes people cross hundreds of miles of open ocean to to reach an isolated island uh when they can't even speak in complete sentences you know that's a really cool uh, it's a really cool way to uh to to end the harsh journey into the into the past um for the moment uh so what do you uh i I really like um we probably shouldn't i don't want to say how it ends but um um, his girlfriend has some doubts after she knows that he harbors this gene of of whether or not she wants to have babies with this guy because of all these this huge past that belongs to him right um I know it's a science fiction conceit, but is there any uh, way that you think, as Will McCarthy, that um, somehow some of these myths and archetypes that are that we find within culture um, have their being somehow inside of us in in such uh, such a convoluted memory form that's in a physical way embodied in us? Is that even possible um i mean you're saying it is in the book <laughs> but you you have quite a bit of a uh, background in in various sciences um speculate for a moment <laughs> in real life tell me what you think if nothing else tony we do have language uh and you know it's clear from from our our oldest stories from the flood myths for example um if we're able to posit that these flood myths we, there was a global cataclysm. There was a global flood. That that was a real event. Uh, if we're able to make the fairly small leap that says that our flood myths are myths of a global flood and the actual global flood are the same event, what that means is that we were able to transmit these stories in some kind of intelligible form for 10 or 12,000 years. Um, now, if, we, if we're going to hypothesize that, that uh, complex language only goes back 60 or 100,000 years, then, you know, you, you get the idea that maybe maybe uh, some of our oldest stories could be a lot older than we think. Uh, and so this idea of, of knights and trolls interacting 30,000 years ago, maybe that's where all of our stories about trolls come from. Maybe they're not from the Middle Ages. Maybe they're not uh, from ancient times as, as we know them, but from really, really, really ancient times. Um, so that was kind of the the whole the whole genesis of the of the book. This idea that that ancient peoples, that the people of the Ice Age and and before the uh, in, in the antediluvian world before the flood, um, that these were sophisticated human beings with with their own rich lives and societies. Uh, and yeah, I, I like to think that that uh, we still remember them in bits and pieces. Oh, you know, it's really cool. Uh really cool novel. So what are you working on now? Uh, now I'm working on a book called Rich Man's Sky, which is about the future of uh, private space programs. My thought is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of private space programs. They have some clear advantages over over government-run programs, but the the one clear disadvantage is that the uh, the egos of a small number of individual people wind up being a very large driver of events. Uh, and so that's uh, that's what the novel is about. So from the distant past to the cutting edge uh, future, <laughs> or near future, looking forward to that enormously. Um, but out now at booksellers everywhere is Antediluvian by Will McCarthy. Um, well, thanks so much for uh, talking to us about about the novel and the the amazing ideas that you have uh, you've embodied in it. Thank you, Tony. I had a great time.
Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Chapter 39 Are you certain it was him? Positive, Sikasa. It is either the fallen or the swiftest warrior who has ever lived in Jarlang, dressed as a merchant. He just dropped four men. Bolatar drew one of his many daggers, held it out, and then let go. It stuck point down in the dirt between them. In the time it took a knife to fall. None of his men were given to much exaggeration, and Bolatar's magical constructs not only looked like hawks, but they had the vision to match. Very well, Sir Castle nodded. That has to be him. I don't know Jarlang. Where is it? Bolatar unrolled his map and pointed at an area in House Thau lands. About here, in a canyon off the trade road. The fallen wasn't that far away, especially to those who could soar above the mountains. Sikasso glanced around the camp. There were four of his men here. The rest of them were spread out across the other houses that boarded Vidal, all on the lookout for their target. Now that Ashok had been spotted, they could track him, as the Grand Inquisitor had commissioned them to do, and make sure there was sufficient carnage left in his wake. Do we follow him? That's what we've been hired to do. However, if they waited like they were supposed to, there was always the risk that the precious sword would be lost, or worse, fall into the hands of rival wizards. The Lost House had big plans and needed that black steel. It was always better to have such things sooner rather than later. His subordinate knew what he was thinking, and Borlatar was just as eager to get that sword as he was. The Fallen has proven to be a slippery one, but he'll be stuck in Jarlang for a bit. I doubt he knows it yet, but a flash flood wrecked the bridge back to the trade road last night. The only other clear path is up the mountain toward the Somsak homeland. Unless he wants to try climbing up canyon walls covered in ice sheets, he'll be there until it melts some. How big is this place? Maybe a thousand people, a handful of warriors, and I didn't see a single banner of the first cast. If it wasn't for a favorable mountain wind, I never would have seen the place at all. No one will miss it. I doubt any of these poor mountain folk are personally acquainted with the Grand Inquisitor. Sicasso mused. You make some good points, Bolatar. Dead now, dead later. Really, does it matter as long as the work gets done? Bolotar had a savage grin. Come on, you know you want to kill this bastard and be done with it. Do you really want to waste our time following the black art all over Locke? And what happens when he realizes he's being followed? Better to strike while he's unaware. Armand never has to know. The others had heard the conversation and stopped their meditations to listen. They were all looking to Sakaso for permission. Their hungry expressions reminded him of the poppy addicts he'd seen in the hidden smoke dens of the capital. His men were desperate for new magic. If he didn't allow them to strike now, it was only a matter of time before one of them stepped out of line and made a move on his own. Sikasa walked to the edge of the cliff and looked across the ancient mountains of Thau. 
The view was breathtaking, displaying miles and miles of new ice and rising steam. The five wizards had made camp perched high in the peaks, because how could anyone hide from you when you could see the whole world? For five generations, his people had remained hidden. In the official histories, his house was listed as extinct, their bloodline extinguished, and their heritage erased. They had once been the greatest wizards in the world, so mighty that they had threatened to upstage the law itself. So the Capitol had crushed them. The survivors had pieced together an existence, selling their skills to the highest bidder, but never forgetting what they'd learned. All those generations in the darkness they'd waited, knowing that if they reclaimed too much magic at once, it would attract the full wrath of the judges. But here they were today, with the Inquisition practically giving a whole ancestor blade worth of black steel to them as a present. Houses had risen and fallen over far less. And if he could take Angruvidal whole, that would change everything. From Sicasso's lofty vantage point, the terraced hills of the Thau farm country seemed unnatural far too orderly and sculpted to exist in such a rugged place. His eyes followed the mountains until he found the steep canyons where Jarlang lay hidden. Something on the mountainside above that was reflecting the sunrise. Glass or polished metal, perhaps. There was no way to tell from here. Sicasso glanced at the map again and traced the dotted lines. That shining beacon he was seeing had to be the old Somsac Fortress, like all rational men, Sicasso didn't believe in gods. But if he had, then he'd have known this was a sign. Five against one is good, but an army against one is better. Molotar! Yes, my Thakur. The wizard approached, eager to hunt. Fetch my bag of body parts. I need to give someone a gift. The reflection had come from a massive steel shield, polished mirror smooth and set on top of the tallest tower of an ancient keep. Even the backwoods mountain folk liked a bit of flash. Sicasso brazenly landed in the field in front of the stone fortress in the form of a great black buzzard, changed back into a man and then walked right up to the front gate. Several crossbows were trained on him the whole time. He spread his arms wide and opened his hands to show that he was unarmed. Not that such a thing mattered to someone who was obviously a wizard. I come in peace and bearing gifts for the terrible and mighty Somsak. There was shouting from the walls as a guard found someone of high enough rank to decide whether to open the gate or not. Curiosity must have outweighed their superstition. Chains rattled and the way was opened for him. Ten warriors marched out, dressed in mismatched hand-me-down armor, and surrounded him with drawn swords. Who are you, wizard? The one with the most tattoos on his face demanded. That must have been how the Somsak denoted rank. Assuming the more ink the face had, the more status. This one must have killed scores of men in his day. I am Sicasso of the Lost House. And I bring an offer of alliance and gifts of friendship for Nadan Somsak. Wary glances were exchanged. They'd heard legends of the Lost House, dark and powerful. The Thakur does not speak to uninvited strangers. I've been told your Thakur doesn't speak to anyone since the Black Heart chopped off his tongue and left him a crippled mute. The circle of swords closed in at the insult. The Somsak used a straight, two-edged blade, and they were close enough now that Sicasso could see the quality of their steel. The blades weren't up to his exacting standards, but still sharp enough to hack him to bits. One of the gifts I bear will cure that condition and give him back his speech. The other will grant the Somsak their revenge. Your words interest us. The officer nodded and a runner was dispatched into the keep. While they waited for the response, the swords barely wavered. The mountain folk had strong arms, that was for sure. You'd better not be wasting our time, 
Our Thakur is not a patient man. From what he'd heard of his sources, ever since losing his duel, their Thakur had alternated between bouts of impotent rage and suicidal depression. After his defeat, he'd taken out his rage on his holdings, raising taxes and executing anyone who questioned the sanity of having a ruler who could no longer speak. Rumors suggested that the leadership of Great House Thou was growing tired of their subordinates' petulant anger, so it would surprise no one if they ordered him to be retired, banished, or even executed. So Nadan Somsak had absolutely nothing to lose. Sukasa gave a polite bow. Of course. A few minutes later, the runner came back and whispered something to the officer. He seemed surprised, but gave a signal, and the sword points pulled back enough for Sukasa to pass. I thought for sure he'd have us hack you to bits, but he will see you. Follow. Sukasa was escorted into the keep. Compared to the nobility of the other houses, or the opulence of the capital, the Somsak keep was like stepping back into a more barbaric time. This must have been how the warriors lived back during the Age of Kings, when the houses were little more than subservient tribes. Scores of men watched him suspiciously as he passed. They wore rough leathers and chainmail shirts that had been continually repaired and passed down for generations. Their decorations tended toward crow feathers and slapped-on paint. The once proud Somsak were little more than thugs now. They were a vassal house in name only. Letting them collect taxes from the terrace farmers kept them from turning to banditry, and whenever there got to be too many of them, House Thou would simply rent out their savages as mercenary raiders to their neighbors. From the large number already gathered here and outfitted for war, it looked as if the Thou had been about to send them on a raid anyway, probably into Vadal lands to take advantage of their misfortune. They appeared ready to strike. Today was Sakaso's lucky day. Their great hall stank of sweat and smoke. Massive war dogs were gnawing on the bones left over from the warrior's breakfast. A muscular, scarred man sat on a massive chair decorated with antlers, coldly studying Sakaso as the wizard entered. His cheeks had been roughly stitched back together from where Angruvadal had spit open his face. The artistic tattoos there had been ruined by the black steel's passing. The wizard gave a very respectful bow. Thakur Somsak, I am Sikasso. Nadan didn't so much as nod. He growled some unintelligible command, but the warrior escort seemed to understand, since they all turned and left the hall, leaving Sikasso alone with their master. The two men measured each other up. Nadan was as imposing as Sakasa was unremarkable. Most of his exposed skin was covered in tattoos that told the story of his many raids and victorious duels. But his eyes told a much different story, one of defeat and shame. And as Sakasa peered through the Somsak leader, he saw a desperate killer teetering on the edge of madness. Perfect. Curious. A Thakor who allows an illegal wizard in his presence without his guards, Sikasso said. You understand, then, that anything I have to offer would be outside the law. Kor! Nadan shouted, banging one fist against the arm of his antlered throne. That's right. I did speak of a cure for your condition. What good is a war leader? who can't give understandable orders. Sikasso reached into a pouch on his belt and removed a small wooden box. Inside this box is a severed tongue. Awakened with my magic, it will replace yours. Sikasso opened the lid and held it up so the crippled Thakor could see. But it comes with a price. The dried piece of meat was forked and black. Nadan's brows crinkled together, the tattoo lines accentuated his anger. Emon! Correct, Thakur. This is a demon tongue. 
taken from a fearsome beast that was slain in Gujara last year. It cost me a fortune on the black market, but that fortune is nothing compared to the value of our friendship. Ost! Drool spilled from the gaps in Nadan's cheeks. The cost is simple. Place this in your mouth, and it will attach to the stump and become one with you. Demon blood will mix with your own. You will immediately gain their speed and resilience, but with it comes their hunger for blood. It is a small price to pay, if you ask me, to make you strong enough to defeat the bearer of Angruvadal. Och! He stood up so quickly that the antler throne crashed onto its side. The war dogs cowered beneath the table. Ashok is here, within your borders. If we don't hesitate, I can show you the way and deliver him into your hands before he escapes. Sikasa smiled. Nothing was more important to the Somsak than revenge. Even after hundreds of years united beneath the law, those who lived on the ragged edges of civilization still retained some of the savagery of the tribes they'd descended from. Ashak must pay. I, too, want the Black Heart punished for his wickedness, but I am too weak to defeat him. But you are strong. And with this, you will be even more powerful. Nadan strode forward and picked up the box. He plucked out the forked tongue and held it up to the beam of sunlight coming through the tall window. The desiccated flesh seemed to soften around his fingertips, becoming as vibrant and slick as when it was still alive. Us on e. That was incomprehensible, but Sakaso guessed he was speaking of Blasphemy. The law frowns upon such things. But once you take Angruvadal for yourself, you can make your own law. Sikasso lied smoothly. He had no intentions of letting the precious black steel fall into the hands of this barbarian. Who would stop you? Who could stand before the Somsak if they had an ancestor blade once again? I offer you your speech back the fearsome physical power of a sea demon, and an opportunity for vengeance. The entire world will speak of your victory. What you do after that is up to you, great Thakur. Nadan Somsak placed the demon's tongue into his ruined mouth. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Bain intern Caroline Irwin. And to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a 25,000-year-old cuneiform tablet chiseled with the first writing by humans, which happened to be a cliché-ridden cyberpunk novel retread that was instantly rejected by the five publishers of the time, and so set the birth of human writing back by 15,000 years, but is still very collectible today. Plus, thanks, praise, and plaudits to Will McCarthy, author of Antediluvian, which is not any kind of retread at all in a very cool book. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>